Hello! Welcome to the SPL Facebook Live with writer-in-residence Arthur Slate. That's me! That's you! <laughs> He's, uh, he is our, I think, 33rd writer-in-residence? Yes. You've been writing for 20 years. You've sold over a thousand audiobooks. That's, you know everything! I did my research. <laughs> I did not want us to be awkward. Oh, and so. it's not awkward. Oh, I'm going to turn away right now. Uh, no, but don't feel like this is awkward. Only to share this with uh, my Facebook feed. Oh, go right yeah. in. Yeah. So, yeah, so don't worry. I'm not already going back to where you know, keep talking to me. Um, so, <laughs> I have some questions. If we, I was looking over, yes, your Facebook page, which is great. Um, and... <laughs> You, one of your job titles, you have several job titles listed on your Facebook page. One of them is former children's book writer and sarcastoid and working at me. <laughs> I, I am. I'm, 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 I'm working, yeah, I, I'm a bit of a sarcastic person once in a while, but I try to make it a gentle sarcasm that doesn't make people cry. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. I try. Yeah. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> that's what we look for in a writer in residence. Yeah. Well, that's although they did provide me, um, you know, with the very musical, um, with the Kleenex. <laughs> yeah. And this is only, I think, the twentieth box we've gone through. You know, so really, that's not very many when you think of uh, Excellent. how many people I've spoken to. That's successful. Well, yeah, exactly twenty people. So. So as part <laughs> of your writer in residency, you make people cry. Yeah. You meet with them one on one. I do to help them, mentor them through writing and offer advice as a published author. Um, you also do events and programs at the library. Yeah. So this is all sort of the spectrum of what Art has been working on. You did do all of your research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, no, I kind of. I, I guess about seventy percent of what I do is actually meet with people. You know, face to face in here, I read about ten minutes or ten minutes, ten pages of their work, and I go through it. Kind of the first three pages, I'll do as if I'm an editor and really mean. Um, not really mean. I shouldn't like let people think that editors are. The mean. Kleenex might or might not come in at that point. Yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll, people are probably getting the wrong mm -hmm. you know, image from that. Um, and then the last, you know, seven or pages is more just kind of the readability of the story and kind of getting more into it. And it's been really enjoyable to sit down and talk with people about their writing. They just don't, normally you don't get a chance to talk about whatever whatever it is you're, you're creating. You don't get to talk, I mean, you can't get your mom to listen to you for an hour yeah. about what you're creating, whereas I'm being paid to do it. And so that's great. You can come and talk to me. Yeah, you have a invested audience if yeah. you need one. So that is very helpful as a writer. Um, do you, so you probably get a wide range of formats, um, a variety of uh, people. Yep. Do you find that hard, trying to go back and forth with different kinds of writing, it's, different kinds of personalities? And things? Yeah, I, th I think it, it is hard because I, I'm, um, or at least I just say it's a challenge. It, mm -hmm. I mean, I write young adults. I, I also write books for adults and, and kind of a variety of things. But I, I get, you know, I get romance, I get history, I get memoirs. Uh, had a couple film scripts. I've had comic book wow. scripts, and so, and, and poetry too, which I am. I admit it's not a very good poet. I had one published, and it was horrible. Um, <laughs> poetry is hard. <laughs> poetry is the hardest. The shorter something yeah. is, the harder it is to write. Is 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 kind of my experience of it. Yes. But I'm, yeah. when when I when I'm dealing with a writer, I try to think who is the audience that they're aiming at. Who's going to read this? Okay. And what is their reaction going to be to that work? And what's the best way to make this perfect for that audience? So when I'm reading a romance, I'm not trying to go, oh, you should maybe you know make this a bit more literary and describe some trees for a bit longer or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's how do we make this the best romance possible? Is kind of what you know I, I ask. And when it's a romance, when it's a, a literary thing, I say, how can we make this literary thing more romantic? Oh no, wait, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, romance. So <laughs> it does. It's it, it is amazing. This is an important part of yeah. writing books. Yeah. 
Um, does everybody want to be published? Like, do they come in and say, I, I need to get this out there? Like everybody who comes in here, you mean? Or, yeah, or everybody you, in the world? Because I'm, sometimes I feel like everybody in the world does want to be published. But, Everyone um, wants their 15 minutes. No, that was, no. The, that, was the, actually, that's, it, that was the interesting thing for me was I've always been very driven as a writer. It's like when I was 16, I wrote my first novel. My goal was to be published and to make money out of it. That was going to be my living. Okay. And um, it took much longer than that to make it a living. But um, many of the people who come here, they're, it's been really invigorating for me because they're really interested in creating. How do I make this the best story possible? And they're not necessarily really consider, you know, worried about an audience yet anyway. And, and some of them aren't worried at all. They just want to write a really good story. They might be writing a memoir for their family. And, you know, how do I make my memoir interesting so that mm. they will, they, my family will read it? Right. You know, that sort of thing. And so I'm inspired by that. And then there's also people who, who write, you know, stories that are, 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 are based on, on famous movies or, or fan fiction. And so you don't get paid for that. You do, you can put it up online and get a certain amount of fame. But so... It's just interesting for me to encounter these people and, and see that they have a different attitude than me and then respond to them in the same way. We're both kind of working towards how do we make it the best story possible. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. How to, how to serve the piece that you're working on to the best of your ability. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What, yeah, what, what can you do so that you know, everybody's going to enjoy it and they don't, you know, their eyes don't start to bleed after the first paragraph or something like that? No, not that... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very vivid visual. <laughs> well, I do write horror, so I never <laughs> apologize for that. No, never apologize. <laughs> Let's go 100% in. Serve the piece that you're working on. <laughs> so this is a Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. If there's anybody out there who wants to ask Art a question, That's right. please jump in. We can leave a comment and... We have someone, Katie is behind the camera, so she can just relay to us what's happening. There Whoa, she goes! There's a giant hand! <laughs> yes. Oh my god! In fact, I'm going to attempt to uh, share this again because I, I was starting to feel oh. like I was ignoring it. We have a question. Oh, there's a question? Deborah asks, what do you think about rigorous research versus family folklore research? So, rigorous research, if you didn't hear that, she's wondering about what Art thinks about doing rigorous research versus family research? Um, family folklore research. Folklore research. Oh, okay. Rigorous research, that makes me think of um, researching something historical. And I guess an example for me is I wrote a book that was set in World War One, And it's, the, the research for that was insane because I, I, you know, I went to London, I went to the Imperial War Museum, I read all these original um, documents written by the people who were in that war. And it became almost, it became too much information. In fact, my first draft of the novel, when I sent it to uh, my publisher, uh, my editor wrote back and said, this is a really good novel art, and um, we just want to cut it in half because you've explained, you know, every single bolt, you've explained about every single bolt and every single ship that ever sailed in World War I. And, and I said, oh, okay, we'll just cut it in half. And my eyes started to bleed then. It was really painful. No, anyway, we won't talk about that. So to, to me, you know, that kind of rigorous research can almost, um, it's really important because you have to get those those great details, right. but you can become obsessed with it and, and you can just put in too much and learn to cut it out. When I think more about researching folklore or myths, uh, to me that is, there, that's a lot of fun because there, it's more, if, if I could say the myths are more playful, people always seem to die in those, in those Norse myths, but they're still playful. Yes. Uh, and it, it, it tends to, when I'm doing that kind of research and then I'm writing something um, based on it, I feel like I have a bit more leeway. I can kind of play around a bit more. And as opposed to with something historical, I feel just a little bit more of a tightening because I want to keep you know, to the truth of what the history was. Yeah, of that. Yeah. So as an example, you have, as some of your books, we have mm -hmm. the Hunch Book Assignment. Which are very inspired. I, I, and I'm not ignoring you, by the way. No, he's. I still am going to share this to my page. I really, I'm going to make this work. There we go. Oh. Share on your timeline. 
It's very strange because I can see myself. I know you're right while there. While we're talking. And, <laughs> do you want me to put that full screen? Oh, <laughs> you know, nice. You, you were saying before I so rudely interrupted you by looking at my own Facebook page. So, like, going to what you were talking about, mm -hmm. these ones, the hunchbook assignments, have a very Victorian classic. Um, there's a lot of overlap with books that people who might might already be familiar with so you're you're taking part of that world yeah and then you've got dust which is set in depression era saskatchewan so also you need to do research to capture the details of that um versus something like amber fang that just came out <laughs> a little bit more modern it, it is a little bit more, and that, I mean, it is set in the modern age, although I have to do research because it is about a library and vampire, um, so uh, there wasn't any real research on that part. It was more just the librarian part, but you're looking at me kind of, um, anyway. <laughs> no! <laughs> How many librarian vampires did you talk to for this book? <laughs> no, I identified strongly with Amber. <laughs> So that was that was a, a different thing. There there is there is research in terms of um, she's kind of like a spy like character, and I wanted to kind of use you know modern instruments and spy to use that sort of thing. Um, but it's much more uh, even though it's written for an older audience, it's much more fun and just I just want to want kind of a fun story is what I wanted. Whereas a lot of these books aren't fun. Um, but they're with, different. They're they different. are. They, they're different in the sense that, with, like the Hunchback assignments and Dust, in a way, uh, because they're set in different times, and they're both, you know, they have a supernatural or kind of a horror horror element to both of them. But I really wanted them to. I wanted the, that element. Uh, I wanted people to believe in the time period that they're set in. So I wanted people to feel like they really were in the 1930s or feel like right. they really are in 1877. And if they believe that, if you've done that detail well enough without boring them, then they might also believe the supernatural element is part of it too. So that was kind of if if you can if you can believe the world that I've created, then you're more likely to believe whatever kind of you know science fiction and fantasy thing I've kind of stuck into that world mm -hmm. and surprised you with. So that's what I'm thinking with this. Whereas this kind of um, uh, I'm not, I, I just love holding my own books up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but. This, this book is, is very, very much, you, you know, right away you know that this isn't necessarily, even though it's set in our world now, it's not the real world in the sense that these ones are trying to be. Although, then again, maybe I shouldn't say that since they're flying around in airships in this one. Um, yeah. But they, but they could have happened. It could have happened. Steampunk. <laughs> That's this, right. You've accomplished, this one is very, um, like your research into library science and stuff like at one point she's talking about her um history of print and books class yep. and i took that class <laughs> so i'm reading it like oh man he knows about librarians i did i did some Very. research i didn't take the actual classes myself no. But yes no i certainly no. certainly did uh, I, I'm still waiting for people going. Why you didn't you didn't get that right that class at all? Right? <laughs> the Dewey Decimal System does not work that way. <laughs> we forgive you. It's difficult. I okay, there's you. another question. Okay. Patricia says, Art, did you write as a kid growing up on the ranch? And if you did, what did you do with what you put on paper at that time? You know, I I did uh, write as a kid, and I think the first time I can really remember writing is. You know, probably when I was about grade five, grade four, grade five, and that's when I was reading The Hobbit and reading The Lord of the Rings and those types of books. So everything I wrote would be people, would be knights, and of course, like my name being Arthur, I would read King Arthur over and over again because I don't know how I identify. I'm not sure which character I identified with in that, but uh, so my my stories I'd write, which for some reason I could never finish them. I'd always get about three pages in, and then I was it would just kind of peter off. I go, well, okay, I'll finish that later, and I still haven't actually back to them. What about Ray Bradbury? Yes. You, you dedicated Dust to yeah. W.O. Mitchell and Wallace Stegner yeah. and Ray Bradbury. So you can see the influence in, of them in there. So yeah. does do reading other authors influence your writing? I, I think 
think so. I mean, I don't know if it influenced so much as the style, but it influences my imagination. Ray Bradbury's a, a, a keen example. When I, when I was growing up, that's who I read and who I kind of loved the most out of all of them. I, in fact, I, I would call him Uncle Ray. <laughs> what? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, not to his face because he was never around. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it really felt like um, felt like he was kind of part of my family, you know, and, and he had such lovely... Horrible story. <laughs> they would yeah. always start out with nice little, beautiful little, you know, towns, and then suddenly aliens would invade or something like that. But it would yeah. all make sense. And so I think, especially when I was writing Dust, because Dust is you know, it's mostly about a small town and about a supernatural uh, rainmaker coming to that town, I was really kind of reflecting that feeling that I had reading Ray Bradbury's books. So yeah, absolutely, they those, those things affected me. And, and to go back to the question, you know, um, I, I think when you're writing, you know, when I was writing, when I was younger and I was writing, I couldn't help but copy exactly whatever I was reading. And I think that helped me once I started to, you know, get older and, and a bit more original, I guess. You know, by the time I was 16, 17, well, I don't know if I was original when I was 16, I was still writing The Lord of the Rings over and over again. <laughs> As if J.R. Tolkien hadn't already done that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he, he did it several times, in fact. Um, but, you know, each time I did that, I started to learn a bit more, and eventually I found my kind of more original voice. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, to, to, to drop names, I did send this book to Ray Bradbury. And, <laughs> I, and, and um, a friend of mine actually had his address, and he wrote back to me. And he, he wrote back this wonderful letter, which is on my wall, that says, I'm so happy, you know, pleased that you wrote this book. I don't know that he had time to read it, but, uh, and I don't, wouldn't expect him to. He was, he was in his 80s by then. But I'm so happy that you sent me this book, you've written it, and I'm so happy to know that I have a literary son out there. I've been blessed with daughters, but not a son. So it's just like... Oh. And, <laughs> me and, and so, Katie are both, like, <laughs> gasping. Oh. This is the dream. <laughs> well, and then... It was all. T it, it was all. Just to add to this, it, it was. It was all typed out, right? And it was on his his um, his newsletter. So it has this wonderful big image of a of a of a house on the top of it. And then there were spelling mistakes, and he had gone through and corrected them. You know? <laughs> and then at the very end, he'd handwritten, "Oh, damn these mistakes! I've been ill. I'll spare you the details." <laughs> so, oh you know. My the both is that a, it's a wonderful thing for somebody of that magnitude, somebody that important to write to a writer here in Saskatchewan. I thought that, but it was also a good lesson for me of that you know how how a writer I don't mean necessarily me but all writers how they can affect people and how important it is to share not just you know I'm not just out there to make money I'm out there to share my stories but also that that one gesture of his and I'm sure he had a million other things going on in his life but to sit down and take ten minutes to write. This letter to mail it, or mm -hmm. you know, get somebody else to mail it. Um, that was that was a really important thing, an important lesson for me to learn to always be giving back. Yeah, so. I have one more question, but I'm wondering if there's other questions from the Facebook Facebookians. Not yet. Charlotte Facebook. says I love my library. Oh, oh <laughs> thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> I love the library too. <laughs> Me too. I have to. Well, I well I don't. I don't have, have to. to. <laughs> <laughs> My, mine's more of a natural. Yeah. And I don't, although you know, as I've mentioned several times, the first day I was here, they had cherry pie. Not because I was here, but there was just cherry pie. And it was I just thought, cherry pie always. This is yeah. <laughs> this is what libraries. I just started to weep. It was very sad, and they said, "Oh, <laughs> here's your Kleenex. There's, yeah. there's more in the back room." <laughs> There's your Kleenex. Yeah. So Charlotte also says she'd like to write her own biography. Do you have any advice for, for autobiographers? Yeah, you know, um, it's it's interesting writing because I, I've 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 dealt with um, I've dealt with a lot a lot of people who are writing their memoirs and their biographies, and I think it's I think it's important to figure out where to start the story. Um, sometimes it's it doesn't always make sense to start at the very, well, I was born on such or such a day. Sometimes you want to find an event that is kind of almost a symbol of your life, we'll say, and have that as kind of the beginning, and then work towards that event. And that kind of um, helps build a structure for the story, if that makes sense. 
So, I mean, that's part of it. The, the other thing I would really suggest is reading uh, other memoirs and see how people do it, because there's such a, a variety now um, that it can just be really helpful in kind of finding your own voice. Oh. Okay. Thanks, Charlotte. We love you, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question that I wanted to ask is, uh, do you judge books by their covers? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Yes? I do. Well, I, I mean, do. <laughs> it is, but it's hard not to. I know, we're, I know what the saying is. You're not supposed to judge a book by its cover. Yeah. But when you're in a bookstore and there's a, you know, 100 books up on the shelves with our covers facing towards you, you can't help but judge them. And it is a, it's, it's one of the things that, um, that authors don't really have control over. Unless you're J.K. Rowling and, you know, unless you're a big name author, the cover is something that the publisher, because they're putting up all the money to publish that book. Right. That the, pub, and the, the publisher decides what the cover's going to be. And they might give you input, and they might not, and, but you have no actual legal say over the cover. Unless, of course, you're self-publishing, then, you know, that's you a difference. You, you can do what you want. You can do whatever you want. You, you have complete control. So, uh, I mean, for, <laughs> hold up all the covers again. Um, I've always really enjoyed, um, and I've been lucky because I have 19 books and, and all of my covers, I've pretty, pretty well all of them, I won't say I've loved all of them, but they, all of them have worked. Um, but this one specifically, the Hunchback Assignments, I was happy about because the artist is actually from Swift Current. He did it. Oh. And he's somebody that I knew who I just suggested, you know, you might want this guy to do a cover because he's a really good artist. And he sent in this sample. And it was like, yeah, that's what we want. And it became, um, you know, it became the, the face of the series, at least in, in Canada and Australia. It's, it became, there were all these different covers all kind of around the world. And that's, that's all also interesting in to see how, you know, different countries take your story, which is exactly, you know, it's exactly the same story, and put something, some totally different cover on it. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're going, what, what does that have to do with the story? And like uh, some of the covers for the Hunchback Assignments again was in in Germany it was like this really kind of dark and it's a really beautiful cover but it was just it was so dark and and almost three D ish and had this kind of dead rat on the front and, 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 but actually it's probably one of my favorite covers um, but then in China the cover that they had was this whimsical one and, and it looked like it had been drawn by you know like a three year old kind of and and yet it it, it looked. You know, it looks so much younger, right? And even my American cover, which is, is different than this one, this one looks like it's probably for, you know, a younger audience, looks kind of comic booky, And the, the American one looked very young adult and was very blue. And so, but all the words are the same, right, inside. Right. It's just what they think will sell um, in, in their market. Yeah. Um, or sort of the different parts of the story they pull out mm -hmm. and, you know, the artists find inspiring and latch yeah. on to because yeah. it is an artist still sort of interpreting yeah. the story. Yeah, that's, that's correct. As long as the artist reads the story before they... True. Because <laughs> that doesn't always happen. Yes. Um, the best covers <laughs> happen when you read the book. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's always kind of... Because um, you finish a book, right, and you've spent a year, sometimes three years writing the book, and in my head, I don't have a cover. There's nothing, there's just the book, the story. Right. And so it's always kind of a surprise to me what somebody comes up with. And I'm just, you know, what you're hoping for is that it's a happy surprise. Yeah, a good <laughs> surprise. Yeah. Happy accident. Yeah, yeah. Um, so getting back to Facebook, uh, if we didn't answer your comment, mm -hmm you will be able to do that. Um, Art can go back onto his Facebook page and answer your questions after we're done. I have a question. Oh. <laughs> if people post on my page, does it show up there? No. Uh, no. So you will you can pull there some you from yours if you want. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, we'll see that one. Is it, is it, is it fun seeing people on Facebook? Looking at Facebook, is it like that's like very meta, it's really and meta. deep, isn't it? Yeah. It's this, also very intimidating. <laughs> this is this is the first time I've been. Oh, look at now we're looking at ourselves on Facebook. This is just really confusing. 
Oh, I've been so catching glimpses, and I'm like, oh, so that's what my hair looks like <laughs> from the side. Oh, nobody's asked a question on my page. I'm just so sad. We that's have okay. one more question. Oh, another question. Oh, and now I'm no longer sad. Someone oh. asked about self-publishing. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, what's the easiest way to self-publish? Oh, I just did a whole two-hour talk about this on Saturday. It's literally the title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was easy peasy, self-publishing. I'll put that on my team. Um, the... I, the easiest way to self-publish is to a write the book. <laughs> you have to do that, and uh, and find a cover, and then you just if you go online, um, there's a, a place called uh, oh it's something to digital now I can't think of the name of it. Draft to digital. Okay. There it is, and if you go to Draft to digital, you can actually just upload that cover, upload the um, the the manuscript. And it will take that and turn it into all the different files to self-publish as an ebook. And it will also it will also export a file for you that then you can then take to places like CreateSpace or um, Ingram Spark, which are print-on-demand places. So you can both uh, use this one draft to digital place to make files for all these all these all these different uh, vendors, we'll say, for, for books. So that is the easiest way to do it. Um, you don't have as much. Uh, I don't do it exactly that way when I self-publish, but I'm just I'm I'm a geek, so I, I want to do things on my own, and I have my own. Uh, you know, when I publish an ebook, I use a program called Vellum, and all that. I'm going to get into too much detail here, um, but that draft to digital is probably the easiest way to do it if you're going to um, self-publish. And I should mention, if you go to my blog, I kind of outline. You have to go back a couple posts in my blog, but I outline how I self-published my own book, which I will once again hold, hold up. Amber <laughs> Fang. This is a self-published book, and so this oh. was was printed. Uh, surprise, eh? <laughs> so this was I picked the cover. It was done by somebody in England, and um, not just somebody. He actually runs a cover company, oh. and uh, it was it was edited by someone in Toronto and also by somebody else in Australia. And then this is the Create Space version of it. So this was printed by Amazon's subdivision Create Space, but it also appears as eBooks in every format and can be and can be bought all around the world. Not that everybody all around the world is buying it, but I encourage them all to do that. I'm sure we're getting Facebook views from all over the world oh, right yeah. now, <laughs> and uh, we'll put the links for your blog and some mm -hmm. of those sites. We're gonna we're gonna upload this video to YouTube yeah. after the live is done, so you can go see it on the Saskatoon Public Library YouTube page, and the links will be will be listed there. So we've got another question on Facebook oh. from Brenda. She says, "Great quote about deadlines on your Facebook page today. Could you talk a little bit more about your relationship with deadlines?" <laughs> When you look into the deadline, the deadline also looks into you. Yes, yes, that's what I said on Facebook, yeah. The yeah. abyss <laughs> I know, of deadlines. I know. <laughs> yeah, it had more of an effect than I, I did do the, uh, when you look into ABBA, ABBA also looks into you, and people didn't think that was very funny. Um, <laughs> oh, you're laughing, oh, you're my people. ABBA fans, um, <laughs> not funny. Um, my relationship with deadlines is very, very painful, I have to say. Um, it's they're, they're, they are a really good thing to have, and, and the deadline I have is actually on Wednesday. Uh, my fantasy novel is due, and um, my so my publisher wants it on Wednesday, mm -hmm. and I kind of um, even though you know months in advance that that's the deadline, I kind of don't always do my work right. You know, in time, I always think. I always think. You know, I'm going to do this early. I'm going to have it all done, and then I'm going to sit back for a week and just let it kind of, you know, sit there. And then I'll go back to it with fresh eyes. And it didn't work that way. Um, <laughs> it, it has yet to work that way after I think 19 books. But uh, I still find that a, a deadline means that um, a you can ignore your family. Uh, no, wait, that's not right. That's a wrong thing to do. <laughs> but it it. A, dead, a deadline can be really empowering, or invigorating, I should say, because I find I can work a lot longer on a story. When I know that deadline's coming up, I, I work longer, I concentrate harder, and I actually get more done than I do you know, before the deadline. But I highly recommend, if 
you can get your work done beforehand, that's probably better for you health-wise because I'll be staying up late tonight and then late tomorrow. Yeah. Well, wait a sec, what is, tomorrow's the 15th, isn't it? Oh, I should really get to work on that. Uh, awkward. <laughs> yeah, that is. Yeah, I'm wait. sure my publisher isn't watching this right now because they're busy editing other people's work. Yeah. You hope. <laughs> you hope. Yeah, they don't get the internet, do they? No. Um, but, like, joking aside, you don't really ignore your family. Like, you have an eight-year-old no, daughter, I... and um, I saw on your Facebook page that you had to explain a Star Wars joke to her about, like, Han Solo shot first. Yes. And, um, I got excited because I love when you introduce kids to Star Wars mm -hmm. because they don't know yet about the whole um, legend of, of Star Wars and the world. And I remember they re-released them in theaters when I was a kid yeah. in the 90s and my parents taking me and they were like, oh, you're going to enjoy <laughs> this. Ha ha ha, we're older than you. Yeah. It's, and is it is it fun? I, it's I don't fun. Know. It's it's interesting. And, think, and again, to think about how stories work. When when I went, and of course I was a kid when it first came out, right? So, um, and I remember that by leaving the theater of Star Wars, that my mind was just blown. It was like I like everything I'd ever dreamed of what life could be was in that movie, right? Yeah. And it happens for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and so and and many authors, you know my age when we talk about things that influenced, influenced us that was one of them that's that was even though we were supposed to talk about novels it's kind of hard to ignore star wars but explaining to my child who is as you said eight years old and it's about i guess a year or so ago that she started being old enough to get star wars i guess mm -hmm. and it was curious because she knew everything already they sit you know they all tell each other the story so the, the stories are out there and she'd already read phonetic books about star wars so like, for example, we're watching, you know, and the whole Darth Vader thing. I hope I don't give anything away. Um, Spoilers! He, he seems to be the father of a main character, I'm pretty sure. Like, they know all this stuff already, so it's not this big surprise. And even there's at one point when Lando Calrissian comes in. Oh, there's Lando Calrissian! He's going to betray them all in the end! It's like, but you know all this. I know, so, so it's a different experience. It's like, oh, now I'm seeing what everybody's been talking about, even though I know what's going to happen. But when the new Star Wars came out and we watched that together, she was, who is that? What's going on? Yeah. What? <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't have understood. answers. I know. We're all burning. <laughs> I know. So, so I it was just, it. you know, in terms of how, how we, we take in stories. I, I'm sad in a way that she never gets to experience Star Wars the way I did. But obviously she still loved it, and she's, she's got this whole kind of world that she can explore now. So, you know, that's good. Yeah, no, I, I knew the whole, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> but still seeing it, it blows your mind. Yeah. I don't, I can't, Star Wars. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>